Welcome to Global Accessibility Awareness Day at MIT. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, before we get started, I wanted to note that this presentation is being recorded, um, and I'd like everyone to make sure that they are muted um, for the presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that, and we'll make sure that they are read out loud and answered. Um, First of all, I wanted to introduce our speakers for today. Um, we have Kathy Cahill, who is the Associate Dean of Accessibility and Usability in Disability and Access Services in the Division of Student Life. She's going to give us an overview of captioning at MIT. My name is Catherine Wall, and I'm an Accessibility and User Experience Consultant on Kathy's team. I'm going to talk a little bit about Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And then we have Stephanie Ike, a digital marketing specialist in resource development, who's going to share the experience of her team with live captioning events. Thank you to Stephanie for joining us today. I also wanted to introduce the rest of our uh, disability and access services team. Um, joining us today, we have Kathleen Monigal, the Associate Dean of Disability and Access Services, Ike Bruchot, Brochu, the Assistant Director of Student Disability Services, uh, Rich Collegero, Accessibility Consultant, Jen D, Disability and Assistive Technology Specialist, Chris LaRoche, User Experience and Accessibility Consultant, and Kate Quinn, Assistive Technology Specialist. Um, so for the next slide, we just wanna welcome you all to Global Accessibility Awareness Day. This is the 10th anniversary of this worldwide event for people to think about, learn about, and discuss digital accessibility. There are events taking place all over the world today, highlighting the importance of digital accessibility. We typically host an event that focuses on some aspect of digital accessibility every year. And this year we've chosen to focus on captioning. Um, now I'm gonna turn things over to Kathy Cahill and let her tell you about captioning at MIT. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, we're really glad to have you all with us today. I know the end of the semester is always a busy time, um, but we're really glad that you're here to learn something about it, um, about digital accessibility and captioning, um, and also um, just about uh, accessibility in general. So thanks for coming. Um, today we're going to talk about, um, many of you may be aware that last year MIT um, settled a lawsuit brought by the National Association of the Deaf. We'll talk a little bit about that settlement and the implementation of it uh, across MIT. Uh, we'll talk about captioning resources available for MIT staff and departments uh, in getting their own material captioned. We will talk about the captioning efforts that have gone on in the past year. Um, Stephanie is going to um, sort of bring a, uh, a department perspective about um, how they have gone about this process in resource development. And we're really glad that she has um, her department's experience to discuss today. And then we'll take any comments or questions that you have um, for the rest of the session. So the first thing, um, of course, um, that we'd like to explain and talk about are, are the benefits of captions. So of course, the primary one is that they provide access to video and audio for deaf and hard of hearing people. But in addition to that, um, they also have other broader uses, including um, indexing for search engines. So if you have captions or transcripts, search engines can crawl those and return better results for you um, for your video and audio. Um, the user experience is better users can access your content regardless of the situation or environment they're in. If they're on a bus, if they are um, in a crowded place or a noisy place, they still have the ability to, um, to view or, um, or read a transcript uh, regardless of whether they have audio or not. Um, it helps people uh, for whom English is a second language um, it helps improve comprehension and understanding of what's being said. And it also helps improve average watch time. So users are more likely to watch a video mm -hmm. and complete it um, if it has captions. 
so um, the NAD settlement uh, was reached um, just over a year ago, around February of 2020. Um, and the settlement became final last July. So um, we are still in the process of implementation and um, uh, we'll share the slides with everyone at the end of the presentation, but um, our website on accessibility and captioning has a link to the details of the NAB settlement um, and the agreement. But what, essentially, I'll just go over some of the, the major parts. Um, the first is that video or audio content created or developed by MIT faculty and staff as part of their work and that is posted on public web pages um, or public third party platforms such as MIT YouTube channels or Vimeo channels needs to be captioned. Um, it also means that video or audio content created or developed by a sponsored student group um, needs to um, be captioned as well. And also it means that um, uh, live streamed events that Institute events puts on such as commencement need to be, um, need to be captioned, live captioned um, when they're happening. Um, within that, we also wanna mention that the settlement terms um, are one thing, but we really do encourage departments, labs, and centers to think about going beyond the terms of the settlement and adding as much captioning as possible to your workflows um, as a best practice so that uh, your video and your audio are more inclusive to everybody. So the timelines um, regarding the NAD agreement are that uh, any video or audio uh, posted on or after September 19th of 2020 needs to be captioned upon posting. If it's audio, you would need to provide a transcript. And any recordings of live streamed events um, that are put up on the site must be captioned as soon as possible, but no more than seven days after posting. And now for existing content, anything that was posted um, on or after January 1, 2019, but before September 19 of 2020, needs to be captioned or removed as soon as practicable, but no later than one year from the effective date. So our effective date was July 21st, 2020, and one year will be July 21st, 2021, this summer. In addition, um, members of the public do have the ability to request that video and audio files be captioned or transcripts provided. Um, and the department has seven business days um, after a request is made to make that available. For content that is posted prior to January 1st, 2019, that needs to be captioned or removed from public view um, within seven business days. And that has to be put in motion by a request from a member of the public. So uh, there is not a requirement to caption things prior to January 1st, 2019, unless there is a specific request about a particular video. In addition to the captioning requirements that are provided, um, according to the NAD settlement, um, all public web pages and channels um, on the MIT domain or ones that are um, uh, channels used by MIT need to have an accessibility link um, at the bottom of the page. And what that accessibility link does is it links to a form that any member of the public can fill out to report an accessibility barrier to request that a video be captioned or to indicate um, some other issue that they're having with the accessibility of a particular um, website or a video. Um, we also have a captioning and accessibility site that has been live since July of last year 
to provide information to the MIT community about the terms of the NAT agreement, uh, some frequently asked questions about, um, about details about the timeline or about more specifics on what needs to be done, things relating to the accessibility link. Um, we also have information on ways to caption video, um, both, um, uh, both ways to caption video, whether it is do it yourself or hiring an outside vendor. Um, and also we have some, a lot of instructional uh, recorded um, webinars and Zoom meetings that we've provided in the past year, trainings that will help explain more of this in detail. So regarding the captioning requests that come in through that accessibility form, um, people can request that can request that um, videos posted prior to 2019 be captioned. And those requests come to our department um, centrally. And then what happens is um, we have a part-time staff person, Brianna, who um, figures out where that um, video lives and gets in touch with the liaison in that department. When the NAD settlement was implemented, um, the provost asked for uh, a liaison to be um, appointed for every department across MIT. So if there were any requests, those requests could go to the liaison who would know who to get in touch with in order to get the video captioned. And um, many of you are NAD liaisons who are joining us today. Um, and have been involved in this since last year. Um, departments, labs, and centers have seven business days to get the video captioned. And um, interestingly enough, we thought there would be a, a lot of requests. Um, the uh, captioning request form went live in October of 2020. And there have been many messages sent in through that um, portal. But to be really honest, most of them have not been legitimate requests. Some of them have been support questions about the site itself or spam or different things like that. So I think that also speaks to the fact that um, a lot of the video that is out there on MIT public sites is already captioned. So I also just wanted to, um, to show you um, what some of our resources look like. So I'll just do a quick switch over and show you. Um, this is our captioning and accessibility site. Um, so we have information here about um, not only captioning, but also <clears throat> general information about digital accessibility. And um, the accessibility request form is here as well. So uh, the first thing I mentioned, I think, was the frequently asked questions. So if you have questions about the uh, NAD settlement and you aren't sure of what some of the details are, we have some pretty detailed questions and answers about scope, timeline, the captioning standards and technical details, and then questions also about the accessibility link and any public requests for captioning. We also have information here on ways to get your video captioned. So um, the top of the, um, the form here is mostly about do-it-yourself tools, and there's some information on that. And then further down, we have information about um, MIT preferred vendors um, of third-party captioning. So um, both uh, post-production and live captioning vendors are listed here. Just want to thank Minerva Tirado from Strategic Sourcing for her help in identifying some of these vendors. Um, and then we also have a site um, here on training and resources. So we have a lot of um, recorded um, sessions, training sessions we've done in the past year about um, captioning. Um, we also had some of our vendors come and do presentations as well. Um, to talk about their services and how to get in touch with them to get set up as a customer. 
Um, we also did a number of training sessions for the NAD liaisons so that they could better understand um, what's being asked of them when there are requests for, um, for uh, video captioning by members of the public. And so um, these are all on the site under accessibility.mit.edu. Hopefully you've already come across some of these. <laughs> um, and if you haven't, now you know where they are. Um, the other thing is um, we will share these slides, but I also want you to know that um, if you do have any questions about captioning, about tools, practices, or you have issues about what needs to be captioned or what doesn't, um, you're welcome to write to us. Um, our sort of captioning help email address is just das-access at mit.edu. And we'd be very happy to respond um, to your questions. Um, the other thing I would really like to point out um, for those of you here who are the departmental liaisons, um, you know, this implementation also happened during the year when COVID happened and suddenly uh, everyone was working from home and uh, classes were uh, remote and it was a crazy year for many people. So um, I really want to uh, thank everybody who, who were willing to put the work into this. And uh, we also have a special thank you for here from Cynthia Barnhart, the chancellor, from Mark DiVincenzo, the vice president and general counsel, and from Susie Nelson, who's our boss in disability and access services, the vice president and dean for student life, because um, we realized it was um, a lot on top of um, the other work that people were doing throughout the year. But we now have an institute-wide network of liaisons who have worked to get their video content captioned and are helping to advance digital accessibility in a multitude of ways. So we just wanna thank you again for your commitment to making MIT a more welcoming and inclusive place. So bravo to you all. And now I'm gonna introduce Stephanie. Um, Stephanie is a digital marketing strategist in the Office of Resource Development. And um, last uh, month when we were putting this together, um, we asked some of our, um, uh, our attendees if anyone was interested in talking about how they have put captioning, um, how they've organized captioning into their work process and since uh, resource development puts on a lot of events. Um, uh, Stephanie uh, came to us and volunteered and we're really thrilled to have her here. So uh, I'm just gonna pause um, and turn the screen over to Stephanie and then she'll get started. And then after she's done, we can take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, let's see. So I just want to thank Kathy and her office for inviting me to join you all today. Um, like Kathy said, our, uh, our department does put on a lot of events, you know, ranging from internal meetings, um, webinars for affinity groups, and then some of you might know we're, uh, we run a series of live roadshows um, for the MIT Campaign for a Better World. And we produce um, a lot of profile videos that are just regular static videos. Um, I'm going to focus more on kind of our transition over the last year from live events into the world of live captioning. Um, talk a little bit about our process. Um, like Kathy said, you know, we were in the midst of we had all these events planned all over the world. Um, and in March, we all found ourselves at home. So um, we had to do a quick pivot to figure out how to transition all of these events to online. And um, live captioning was brand new to us. Um, and we've learned a lot around, uh, along the way. So I just kind of wanted to walk through some of what we've learned over the past year and hopefully <laughs> give you some quick tips that will make your process easier. 
Um, like I said, we already had a really good process for closed captioning, but um, we had to make an effort to get live captioning. It worked into our workflow. Um, so at the start of every meeting for an event, for any kind of webinar, we ask, does this event need to be live captioned? And I would say 99% of the time, our answer is yes. Um, like Kathy said, there's lots of reasons people need captions. Um, and we have had people ask, you know, is this event going to be live captions? And our feeling is, you know, if one person asks about it, how many people want to ask and didn't feel comfortable asking? And we want to be as inclusive as possible. So we've just really leaned hard into it. Um, so after we talk about our live captioning needs, of course, we talk about what we're going to do with the video afterwards. Are we going to post this on YouTube? Is it going to be on an internal site? Um, who needs to review this? All those nitty gritty things. Um, how long is this going to take it? The longer you can give yourself, um, the cheaper it's going to be too. <laughs> so you're not paying rush fees to get it captioned, you know, in 24 hours. Um, so those are all things we think about. Um, something else we've done, uh, before I go on, I'll just say that throughout this past year, personally, I'm really happy that this has just become a normal thing for our department. Um, we have ambassadors on the team, um, you know, who are reaching out to other departments and kind of just spreading the word of why this is so important. We've really gotten everyone on board. So that's been gratifying. Um, we've developed an internal style guide for ourselves, um, which makes it easier both for, you know, the live captioners and the closed captioners um, and ourselves. You think about, for example, the word COVID. Um, some people write it in all caps. My department writes it with only a capital C. Um, so things like that, you can send that to the captioners and then they'll work that into your transcripts. You don't have to um, go back and correct those. And then we also have references to those official standards. Um, so if there's a question about, should this be a number, should this be spelled out? Um, our staff has quick access to those too. And then, like I said, um, be an advocate. A few other things we do is um, we let people know up front that the event will be live captioned and we ask about accessibility needs. Um, we don't typically have sign language interpreters, but if um, someone requests one, absolutely, we, we will have that at the event for them. Um, book your captioners in advance. We had events taking place in November last year, a couple in February. Um, turns out political events, major sporting events, uh, commencements, uh, captioning services book up fast. So um, plan early. We also did a lot of practice sessions because no, it looks kind of on paper, like maybe you know what's going on, but um, there's a lot of URLs to enter in weird places. Um, it's new, so we just would walk through every step of the process with our staff. We would have captioners on hand um, to test the live captioning process. Um, and then prior to each of that, we always had someone assigned to the captioner, and that person is responsible for checking in, making sure captioning works, monitoring throughout the events for any technical issues, um, just generally having that contact you can communicate to the people behind the scenes to make sure things are working. Because it's live, it's online, you never know what's going to happen. Um, so that just kind of leads into the whole communication plan, um, whether it's, you know, you have a Slack channel dedicated um, to talking to one another, or you're all going to text each other, um, just have a plan. Then I just wanted to share a few of the resources that are kind of my go-to spots. Um, 
National Captioning Institute is kind of our preferred vendor for personally um, our live captioning events. Um, they do tons of work for major broadcasting companies, etc. cetera. Um, in my T video productions, we also do a lot of work with. Um, they're great, especially if you have live streams that are going somewhere to like Facebook or LinkedIn, um, they can really help you sync all those pieces up. And I can't say enough good things about the accessibility office and the links that Kathy shared. Um, there's even more there, um, but definitely take a look. Um, and finally, just a few more little closed captioning tips. Um, these are pre the primary tools that I use. Um, and there's a few pluses. There's no one size fits all tool. So um, I just wanted to mention um, rev.com. I think 3Play has something similar, but they have a built in captioning tool that allows you to really easily edit your files, um, pull out clips if you want. And it's just an easy way without putting it into a complicated uh, program like Premiere to do some editing. If you only have a transcript file, um, I've discovered that on YouTube, you can use those transcript files um, instead of a caption file and YouTube will auto sync that for you. And then you'll have to fiddle with the timing, but um, that's another good shortcut. And then Premiere for more complicated things. Um, I think that about wraps it up for me, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll just give it back to you, Kathy. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was really helpful. Um, I know we were having getting some messages in the chat about um, captions disappearing. And I don't know if that's still happening or not for people. Yeah, I think I can uh, speak to that. Um, so because Kathy had transcripts on her screen mm -hmm. and she was screen sharing, I think they were showing up for all of us. Um, and then when we switched screen shares, um, they oh. disappeared. But if, if people want to individually set them up for their own um, Zoom settings, there's a live transcript button at the bottom um, and you would select show subtitle and then they should stay consistent for you. Um, but that's the question of your settings versus when we were all seeing Kathy's settings. Thanks, Jen. Sure. Okay, well, I think we are ready for questions and answers. Um, and I think um, Kate Quinn from our team is gonna um, take some of those from the chat. I haven't seen any questions posted at the moment, but if anybody has any to ask, please feel free to go ahead and add them to the chat. Sure. Carolyn is asking, is Zoom doing the live captions right now or is it another service? It is an outside vendor, a live captionist who's remote. Um, I believe it's, it's Caption First, one of our vendors. Um, generally, uh, Zoom auto captions don't have the level of accuracy needed for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, so if you do have any um, attendees who need captions as an accommodation, uh, it's best to use live captionists. RJ is asking, are transcripts accessible instead of captioning for videos after the fact as a general rule? if the recorded video was created without captions? That's a good question. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, 
it's best to have captions because then the information that's being spoken is synced with the video itself. But if it is an older video, um, that um, might be difficult to um, to caption. Um, I think a um, a transcript would suffice. If um, any of my OGC colleagues are here and want to weigh in, um, that would be very helpful. <laughs> but they may not be. If I find out differently, um, I'll send a message to the contrary. Oh, Kim, please do. Kim says she can weigh in as a deaf person on that. Yes, as a deaf person. <laughs> I prefer to see captions on video rather than a transcript because there's a lot of visual important information that's there. You're seeing the person who's speaking, you know, you, you can see who's talking. It's a bit much better option to use live captioning. You know, if you use that in the first place, that's good. So that's my reason for presenting that. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Sure, Anne, please go ahead. Is there support available for working with vendors that do not provide required accessibility features? I understand departments should choose vendors that provide the required services, but sometimes things come up, particularly around remote training slash live online platforms. That's a good question, Anne. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking and rereading your, your comment. Yeah, generally, especially, I don't know, with there are many, many different kinds of online platforms now for meetings and for trainings and for webinars. And uh, we definitely encourage uh, departments, labs, and centers to think about um, uh, the ones that they're considering using if they have a choice in the matter um, and how accessible they are. Um, that's something that's come up a lot for um, for our department, um, you know, we often know that um, various departments might use a particular platform or a particular license um, of a product that we're not familiar with. So um, it's it's best to try to find out as much as you can from the vendor um, before signing on if they have accessibility features in their platform. We also had a comment that the font size on the live transcript was a bit small and others pointed out that you can resolve that by clicking on the subtitle settings. I know I really do love that about the Zoom settings is that you can change um, how the captions appear, um, which is incredibly helpful. And just another comment from Anne, obviously we need to vet vendors, but it's difficult to get things 
changed in time to allow people to participate. Right, and so I, I think the issue there might be is um, then needing some kind of accommodation or an alternative access plan for someone who needs to participate. Um, so if, for instance, um, uh, if someone was sharing a screen and um, obviously screen sharing isn't available to screen reader users um, because it's an image, uh, one thing you might consider doing is, um, is describing what the visuals are on the screen for someone who can't see it. Another comment from Kim, sometimes a particular vendor is the only one that provides the needed service. And if they are not accessible to me, I'm just sort of stuck. I can ask for them to add captions, but I don't have the weight of the Institute backing me up. It feels sometimes like 10% of my job is figuring out how to get the access I need to do it. Yeah, and, and again, um, Kim, you make a really good point because we're also, um, uh, in the Digital Accessibility Working Group, which um, is an institute-wide um, working group to come up with some um, recommendations around digital accessibility of IT. Uh, one of the things that um, we are considering is, um, you know, accessibility in, in the procurement phase. And it's also problematic, though, I agree with you, if a vendor um, doesn't have that particular service, um, you know, ultimately you'd want to be able to say, sorry, we're not going to buy it. But if, it, if the contract's already been signed, you know, we don't have that option. So then the next best thing is try to come up with an access plan. But the hope is that um, down the line, uh, accessibility can be part of the procurement and the contract process. But in the meantime, I'm at a disadvantage in trying to do my job. Absolutely. It shouldn't be your job to try to figure out what the access issues are. Yeah, so I think it sounds like uh, there are no more questions. Catherine, do we want to wrap up? Just I quickly so. before you did that, sorry, um, Anne has just oh. said it would be helpful to have a list of recommended vendors. Sure, maybe we can um, be in touch and to talk about what the specific product is. Um, we'd be very happy to. Um, to discuss, you know, the nature of it, and um, if there's any vendors that um, that have more accessible versions of the same type of um, software, online training tools. Sure. Yeah, let's talk offline about that. I'd be very happy to. Okay. Um... If that's all the questions we have, then I think we'll end a little bit early, but we wanted to thank everyone for coming um, and for bringing such good questions. We will um, be uh, posting this on our website um, as soon as we get it um, finally captioned. Um, and in the meantime, if you do have questions about um, captioning or other accessibility issues, you can send them to accessibility at mit.edu. Um, and I think we had one final comment. Um, 
Kim is just saying it would be helpful for MIT as an institute to take a stand on this issue. It's basic equity, um, which should be part of MIT's commitment to disability equity and inclusion. Um, and I think that's actually a really nice note to end this on. That's an important statement and thank you. Um, so thanks to everyone for participating. And we will see you hopefully at one of our next accessibility office hours. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you.